All right, we are back with a new video. And today we are back talking about Friendship is Magic and continuing with the season episode ranking, this time doing season two. Now, last time I did do season one, ranking all the episodes from that season. And of course, now we're gonna be doing the same thing with season two. And I mentioned this in the last video, but this is part of a broader project that I'm gonna be doing where eventually after doing these episode rankings for all the seasons, I'm going to be doing one massive episode ranking. And obviously with this, we're going to be talking about some season two episodes. So this should be a bit more interesting as season two definitely has some stronger episodes, in my personal opinion, compared to season one, but also some pretty notably bad episodes and notably flawed episodes, which we'll certainly be getting into. But there are 24 episodes to rank, again, including the season premiere and the season finale as one episode each. Again, that adds up to 24 episodes, but let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into the video. So starting off at number 24, the worst episode from season two is an episode I already talked about in a previous video. And similar to season one, it is actually another Spike episode, but here we have Dragon Quest. And I'm sure a lot of people saw this coming. I mean, this is one of the worst episodes in the entire series, in my personal opinion, and the fact that it is the bottom of this ranking is pretty fitting. And I feel like I I discussed a lot of the issues I had with that video in the Spike episode ranking, so check that out. But obviously the way in which it handles uh, dragon culture, dragon relations, what it means to be a dragon is completely backwards, in my opinion. Like... Obviously, there's the whole confusion at the beginning of the episode where the ponies are observing the dragon migration like they're animals, which is just weird. But then we see later in the episode that, again, it is a full on culture and we see Spike very much want to get involved with that. However, obviously, all the pony characters really much discourage him for doing so, where we have that line at the beginning of Spike saying that he's not a real dragon and then the ponies are, are agreeing with Applejack saying, but why would you want to, Spike? Which is not good. And then obviously later on, Spike ends up going on the quest, meets the Garble and his Goonies. And of course, a lot of the episodes just not very fun to watch. I mean, again, it's basically toxic, toxic masculinity as they're pretty much acting like a bunch of frat bros, sort of initiating Spike into their like frat, basically, which isn't fun to watch. And again, I feel like it really gets a lot of this cultural stuff confused where obviously dragons are a race or they're supposed to be a race. And yet a lot of the issues with their culture stem from toxic masculinity, which is just not great at all. Really the way in which it handles it is not good at all. And of course the ending in which Spike admits that, you know, like, I'm not, it's not about what I am. It's about who I am, which yes, is technically true, but Obviously, it's coming from a worldview in which pony culture is considered the center of morality, which is not great at all. I mean, Spike kind of accepts the fact that he is a dragon that grew up in pony culture, is a dragon that has accepted pony culture, and that pony culture is supposed to be presented as good, while the dragon culture is supposed to be presented as bad. Again, very... Uh, troubling if you think about the implications of that so again i already talked about this episode i don't want to spend too much time on it again it's bad and it's here at number 24. now we're moving on to number 23 and we are talking about an episode i have not previously discussed so that should be exciting and this episode is pretty infamous i mean it's pretty widely regarded as one of the worst episodes and actually to the point where i did consider like putting it a bit higher, like maybe want to give it the benefit of the doubt to a degree, but I felt like I just couldn't justify it. But here in number 23, we do have the mysterious Mayor Duel. And again, everyone knows about this episode. Everyone knows that it's a bad episode. Everyone knows that it's a widely hated episode. And obviously it made me stop to think, like, is it really that bad? And I feel like in a lot of ways, this episode is pretty similar to Ghostbusters, where obviously it has a very similar message of like not being a showboat and not being too big of a like braggadocious person. However, again, similar to Ghostbusters, I ultimately decided that it had plenty of faults to where it probably deserves to be towards the bottom here. And I can see the debate for this one being worse than Ghostbusters. 
However, actually, I think this episode does have slightly more uh, upside to it as we see, first of all, at the beginning where Rainbow Dash is first getting praised for a lot of her heroic deeds. We actually see her get a bit embarrassed the first time she gets praised. And I thought that was a very nice touch. And while obviously she quickly grows accustomed to this fame to the point where she becomes like pretty annoying to a lot of people. And obviously her friends think that she's been pretty annoying as well. And obviously pull off the entire scheme of humiliating her or at least overshadowing her. And again, similar to both Busters, there is a lot of self-righteousness going on between the rest of the main six and arguably a degree of hypocrisy as well, where we see them literally doing the same thing that Rainbow Dash is doing, literally doing all these deeds, getting like praise for it. And while the whole point is that they don't bask in it, they don't take the time to publicly acknowledge their fame. I mean, we do see the main six like out of costume, like talking a lot about the mysterious Mary Duel. It's like, oh, uh, did you see what the mysterious Mary Duel did? Oh, is, aren't they amazing? Aren't they so humble? And again, just giving themselves a big pat on the back here, which again, isn't the best uh, thing to be giving off here, especially once you know that they are supposed to be uh, like the ones behind it all. So that's not great. Obviously, Rainbow Dash starts to compensate a bit, trying to gain relevancy again, only for the others, uh, ponies to not really be uh, that endeared to her anymore and obviously we had that moment where she is sort of sad and is sort of reflecting upon all this and really feels deflated which you know isn't the worst scene in the world I mean there's obviously a moment I'll be talking about very soon that is probably a bigger damp on it, the episode as a whole so it's not the worst thing in the world but a lot of the reason this episode is so bad is because of the rest of the main six the fact that they engage in such a scheme to begin with is, again, not only convoluted, but also, like, again, it's kind of hypocritical. Like, the fact that they are still getting praise for a lot of this. Like, they never actually take the time to confront Rainbow Dash on her, you know, like, bragging. I mean, they all they do is suggest that she should be a bit more humble. But instead of actually, like, saying that she's being too humble and that she needs to cut it out, she instead... They instead to sub subject her to such humiliation and really uh, drag her down, which isn't great. So again, there are a ton of flaws with this episode in terms of its premise and execution. And again, I do agree with the sentiment from most of the fandom here. This is a bad episode. And again, the message, while not the worst message in the world, is really beaten over your head. And even in execution, again, there are still issues with it. So like I said, it's a bad episode. But there are several key moments that keep it from being the worst, but it's here at number 23. Now we're moving on to number 22, and we have a bit of a similar episode in that it is sort of annoying in a lot of ways, but again, isn't completely bad, but obviously has a really bad part of it. But here we do have Ponyville Confidential. And I already talked about this one in my CMC episode rating, and I'm sure there are some people who think that I have this one a bit too low here, but I really do punish the episode for that last third of the episode when the CMC are unable to get out of the job due to Diamond Tiara's threat to blackmail them. And in turn, we have to watch several minutes of the grownups like really dunking on the CMC and really making them feel bad all over a student publication from a school it's like why do these grown-ups care so much about what a bunch of students have to say about them i mean it really makes the again a lot of these grown-up ponies seem hypocritical especially when they were so eager to eat up all the gossip right up until it was about themselves i mean and the fact that the episode doesn't recognize that hypocrisy more i mean they do to a degree largely through twilight but even twilight engages in the shunning uh, like towards the end of it so that's not great either and again that last third when the adults really are shunning these uh ponies and in turn just getting so offended by the words written by a bunch of five-year-olds while eating up everything else that was written about other ponies is just so bad to me and it really drags the episode down to such a degree that I don't really like watching this episode very often. Now, I'm sure some people may say that this is an overreaction, that I am, again, putting too much weight on that. 
But when that takes up such a significant portion of the episode with the adults and their entire role in this, plus the fact that they never seem to learn their lesson at the end. I mean, it's not even that they learn that they probably shouldn't be laughing all this gossip. It's more so that they got offended when the story was about them. And in turn, that sort of made them realize that, hey, maybe this isn't such a good idea. So that's not great. We don't really get much focus from them either, which isn't great. And again, aside from that, the rest of the episode just is kind of boring, but it is not as actively bad. It's not completely broken. It's more so the ending that really drags it down, but still it is so bad that I had to leave it here at number 22. Now we're moving on to number 21 and we kind of have a similar episode to the episodes we just talked about and that it is largely flawed. However, there is some saving graces to it, but here at 21, we do have a friend indeed. I, again, I already talked about this one in my musical episode rating. So it's sort of funny how a lot of these episodes are ones I already talked about, but obviously again, the flaws of this episode are apparent. I mean, Pinky doesn't seem to take a hint for most of it. And again, spends a lot of the episode just annoying Cranky Doodle. And while I am a massive Pinky fan, I had to admit that she goes a bit too far with a lot of this doesn't, again, doesn't get the hint that Cranky just wants to be left alone. And obviously she keeps pushing and pushing and pushing until, again, she damages his house, damages his scrapbook, and obviously yells at her. And while Pinky does eventually make it right, I mean, again, we had to sit through a whole lot of Pinky just trying over and over again to get Cranky to speak up and him just not having any of it. So it's not only, again, bad in the sense that Pinky can't take a hint, but also kind of boring if you ask me. Now, I think the main thing that saved this episode from being even lower is the music, of course. Obviously, this is the episode that has the smile song in it. Again, a great song and obviously a great scene, even though it doesn't really connect too, too much with the rest of the episode. And even some of the smaller songs that Pinky set sings, like One She Beats Cranky, is somewhat interesting. Like, I do love the Welcome the Ponyville song that she sings with the machine. I think that's something at least. And again, the music is the main thing keeping this episode as high as it is. It does give me a decent amount of enjoyment, but again, the flaws are very apparent and I can't have it too much higher. So it's here at number 21. Now we're moving on to number 20. And this next batch of episodes are all ones that are part of the boring tier. These episodes are all pretty boring for the most part. And while they may not be the most technically flawed, they are ones that, again, give me very little enjoyment. But at number 20, we do have Hearts and Hooves Day. And this is arguably the most flawed of the bunch, as well as the one that gives me the least amount of enjoyment, where obviously a lot of the episode is just about Hearts and Who's Day, and obviously the CMC trying to get uh, Cheerilee and Big Mac together. And obviously they resort to um, casting the potion in order to get them to just chemically fall in love with each other, which again has some real world implications that aren't ideal. But a lot of the episode is just kind of boring where, again, once Cheerilee and Big Mac are attracted to each other, again, just seeing them just get all lovey-dovey and all wanting to be with each other at all times, it's just pretty boring. And again, I just wasn't too invested in it. Now, the main uh, thing that I remember from this episode is during the romantic dinner scene or the picnic scene where we have the CMC like hiding in the bush, watching them trying to take the bait. And then it just keeps cutting between Cheerilee and Big Mac and then the CMC hiding as their smiles get bigger and bigger and the camera just gets closer and closer to their faces. I find that mildly amusing. And the fact that they literally do the exact same thing again later with the potion for the second picnic, the same like shot by shot like stuff makes it very interesting as well. But aside from that, I mean, that's really the only thing I truly care about in the episode. Everything else is just, it's just pretty boring. I mean, I know there's a song in the episode, but honestly, it's not my favorite. But there isn't too much wrong with this episode aside from the implications of, again, them basically drugging Shirley and Big Mac. But it's just not enough to keep it too, too low. So I have it here at number 20. Now we're moving on to number 19. And again, we have another largely boring episode. But here we have the cutie pox. And again, I mean, what is there to say about this episode? Honestly, not much. I mean, again, I already talked about this one in my CMC episode ranking, so you can check that out. But obviously, this episode is pretty boring. I mean, it's your typical uh, Apple Bloom and the CMC want to rush their cutie marks and have to learn the lesson of not uh, 
being able to do so, and then obviously not learning their lesson at the end. And again, I feel like out of all these episodes, again, while it isn't the only one, and I certainly have rated other ones higher than it, this is definitely the most generic of the bunch. You also have that playground scene after Applejack gets her, Apple Bloom gets her first cutie mark from the uh, spell that goes on for way too long. Like we literally just see her doing hula hoop stuff over and over again. It's really boring. And then again, even once she starts getting out of control with all the extra cutie marks, I mean, it's not very interesting. I mean, there's that. But again, this is a largely boring episode, but largely inoffensive. And a big reason that is here at number 19. Now we're moving on to number 18. And oh boy, we're on a roll here. Another episode that I already talked about in a previous video, which is sort of weird that season two has so many of these, but it's just how it is. But at number 18, we have Heartwarming Eve. And again, this is a holiday episode explain sort of the origins of Equestria. And this episode is fine. I mean, I don't really get too attached to a lot of it. I mean, yeah, it's kind of cool to see the origins to a degree, but, you know, it's just kind of whatever for a lot of it. I mean, it's not even that much of a holiday episode. It's more so just a flashback episode while the main six are putting on this play. And again, it's interesting to learn about the Winnegos, but they also kind of, they're sort of problematic when considering the show's universe. They sort of imply that, Ponies are friends with each other, not because they want to, but because they have to in order to survive, which again does have some real parallels. So it's probably not the worst thing ever, but still a weird thing to throw in. And obviously the fact that, you know, like we have to see a lot of this history play out. I mean, yes, it does have its moments. There is some interesting interactions between the different characters, but at the end of the day, it is a mostly world building episode. It doesn't have too much aside from that. Plus, I didn't love the ending where we literally hear the Windigos once the main six are arguing backstage. So that's not great. So again, at the end of the day, I mean, there are some minor issues with it, but there are also plenty of things going for it. But at the end of the day, it's just not that interesting to me. But it's here at number 18. Now I'm moving on to number 17. And this is another weird episode to talk about because for the most part, it fits into the boring tier but it's also more flawed than the episodes that we already talked about. However, there is enough merit there, at least for me, to where it probably doesn't belong below it. But here we do have Baby Cakes. And for some reason, I already talked about this one in my musical episode rating. I mean, yes, it is technically a musical episode as I defined it. But again, I can see the debate for this episode being lower. I mean, there are plenty of boring things pieces to it like a lot of it does seem to follow your typical babysitter plot and like and has all the usual jokes of there being a new baby like you can always expect there to have a change the diaper scene or having to deal with all the babies crying all the time so that's not a particularly great again it is also more flawed than some of the episodes we just talked about because we obviously have the inconsistency with the pony genetics some world building issues there there's also the inconsistency with the babies, like being able to have outsized uh, magical and flight capabilities for their age. As we see in other episodes that babies can't exercise magic to the same degree that, you know, like pound cake can or they can't exercise flight the same way that pumpkin can. So obviously that's an issue there. It seems to largely exist to make pinkies a job much more difficult so that's not great however again there again there are still those flaws and there are still those boring segments but what elevates this episode for me is that at the end of the day it is a pinky episode and i think there is enough going for it with this being a pinky episode we have the entire storyline of pinky being underestimated the entire episode with the cakes not wanting Pinky to be a babysitter for them and literally going to every other main six member, like asking them to babysit, despite Pinky asking repeatedly to babysit and being openly eager to babysit. You know, there's that element to it. And it's only after all the other options are exhausted that they reluctantly ask her to babysit. So there's that element to it. Later on the episode, Twilight comes over to help out. And while, again, Pinky is initially willing to allow Twilight to do so, Twilight says that babies take a lot of work and some ponies are just not cut out to handle their responsibility, 
which of course offends Pinky and causes her to kick her out. And from that point on, the story becomes a lot more about Pinky wanting to get past being underestimated to be seen as more than just a mere child. So I think that element to it is interesting. And obviously we get to the scene where she does break down, where again, I do have complaints with the situation that allowed the situation to get out of control with the babies having these extraordinary abilities. However, I do admire the fact that it does tie into, you know, like Pinky being underestimated and her breaking down is her fear that she'll never be trusted again, that the others were right in thinking that she couldn't handle the responsibility. And again, considering Pinky's character, like the fact that, you know, she can be underestimated and you know, like some ponies think that she is simply someone that throws parties and tells jokes and doesn't really offer anything of seriousness is pretty touching and again ties into why I like Pinky as a character so much. So I think that element to it is interesting. Plus the ending is kind of something. So there's that. So again, there is enough merit there to have this episode a bit higher, at least for me. I do enjoy this episode more than most other people. Although at the end of the day, I can't see the issues with the episode. I can acknowledge why some people may find this episode pretty boring or pretty lackluster. And that's a big reason that this episode is as low as it is. However, there just is enough there for me to chew on that makes me put it here at number 17. Now we're moving on to number 16. And again, we're kind of sticking with this tier a bit of episodes that are flawed but not necessarily boring, or at least this episode isn't as boring as Baby Cakes or some of the episodes we just talked about. However, there is some merit to it, although it is still pretty flawed. And here we have Putting Your Hoof Down. Now, if you're like me and you watched Mr. Enter in his early days, then you probably know about this episode. Again, he labeled it the worst episode in the entire series. I mean, granted, that was back in like season three or four, but it was still one where he, he obviously had a massive bone to pick with how it portrayed Fluttershy and how mean spirited it was. And obviously those issues are still present. However, considering its placement on, on the list, I don't necessarily consider it the worst episode of the series and even not the worst compared to season two, which again was around the time where he was making that claim. But again, there are still issues with the episode. I do think the episode on the whole is a bit too mean-spirited. Like, even before Fluttershy's uh, big rant, I mean, they're obviously the background ponies just being kind of rude for a lot of it. And we see Pinky and Rarity engage in some underhanded tactics in order to get what they want. Again, a bit cynical for my liking, and it just seemed a bit too much for their characters per se. But, you know, like, it kind of gets the point across. And obviously we get to the big rant in which Fluttershy basically says that Pinky and Rarity are wasting their lives, which is pretty brutal if you ask me. And I think there is a bit of a missed opportunity in that they don't really linger on it, that Pinky and Rarity are so quick to forgive uh, Fluttershy for saying that. Like, and they're so quick to say that it's just what the new Fluttershy is saying rather than what the old Fluttershy is saying. And the fact that we never really... Uh, get any explanation for why Fluttershy was motivated to say that. I mean, obviously this had to have been something Fluttershy at least thought about before if she was just cooking it up now, but maybe just never had the assertiveness to say it to their faces. But I mean, I don't know. That's just me. And again, the, the mean spiritedness doesn't help this episode very much. However, there are other aspects to it that I enjoy like Again, while I do think the episode is a bit too mean-spirited, I, I also think there are some funny moments, like Iron Will is just pretty funny as a whole. I do enjoy a lot of his one-liners and a lot of his character in the episode. And I think, like, Fluttershy applying some of these one-liners to, like, get back at some of the ponies is pretty interesting. So, again, there is some comedy in the episode that I admire. And while I think Fluttershy ends up going a bit too far in her assertiveness, I do like the way they handle the message at the end where she obviously learns to be assertive at the end of the day, not completely going backwards with her claims, but obviously using her assertiveness to stand up for her friends in order to like, like point out Iron Will's uh, 
loophole in his sales pitch. So that's something at least I thought that was a pretty interesting way of her getting around the payment. I thought that was interesting and also highlights how bad of a business man that Iron Will is where he literally says that he'll give his service for free if they're not 100% satisfied, which is like, well, what if they're only 99% satisfied? So I think that's a bit funny. And I do like her letter to Celeste at the end where, which does kind of imply that this is a prequel to the series. Like that was a common like theory that I heard a lot about during the early days of the fandom, or at least the early days when I was in the fandom, which, which is sort of a way to excuse some of Fluttershy's behavior. Also to explain why Twilight is in the episode. I thought that was a bit interesting as well. So there is some merit to the episode. And again, I do enjoy this episode more than the ones we just talked about. But again, I also acknowledge the flaws with it. I think Fluttershy still goes a bit too far in her rant and they don't really address it or call her out later on. And obviously, even before that, there's some mean spiritness that I don't particularly like. So because of that, I can't have it too high and it's here at number 16. Now we're moving on to number 15 and we kind of have a similar episode, although one that's a bit less flawed, but also not quite as entertaining but here we do have made the best pet win and to me I view this episode kind of similarly to putting your hoof down in the sense that it is not super well liked granted it doesn't have the same level of hatred as putting your hoof down has garnered at least in the past but it's not particularly great either I mean I think the main issue with the episode is the way in which a Dash treats a lot of the animals throughout the episode you know, it's kind of seems like she's mistreating them at certain points and yelling at them and pushing them beyond their limits. And then Fluttershy doesn't really do that much uh, in response. So that's not particularly great. But really, a lot of the episodes just kind of boring to me where it's like, OK, for the most part. But it's like you have all these challenges that makes me wonder, like, does Rainbow Dash really care about all these things? I mean, I think at the end of the day, she really just cares about having someone that you know like she can fly with or at least like jam with or something like that and it's pretty obvious throughout a lot of it that you know like tank is going to end up being the one that she picks at the end even though like he there's so much attention the episode garnered towards uh Raymond Dash putting down tank only for tank to save the day at the end and obviously picking him over everyone else so there's that at least also the song which I know there are people that like the song, but for me, it's just kind of okay. I think it goes on a bit too long and the melody is just kind of weird at points. So it's just, again, it's just sort of an okay song, although it's interesting to see both Rainbow and Fluttershy singing together. But at the end of the day, this episode is just kind of all right. I mean, yes, it is harmed a little bit by like Rainbow Dash mistreating some of the animals and her considering pets that realistically she probably shouldn't be considering like a bee like who wants a bee as a pet so I don't know I mean it's not enough to put it all the way down in the bottom tier but it's also not super high and I have it here at number 15. Now we're moving on to number 14 and we have an episode that honestly I'm just fine with I mean I don't have too much to say about it and here we have family appreciation day again I already covered this one in my CMC episode rating but it's it's just fine. I mean, Apple Bloom like is embarrassed to have Granny Smith speak in front of the class. Diamond TR perpetuates that. Granny Smith speaks in front of the class, and it turns out that she's not so boring after all. So that's something at least. But honestly, I just don't have anything really to say about this episode. There isn't really anything too wrong with it, but it also doesn't really give much to me either. So I have to leave it here at number 14. Now we're moving on to number 13 and we have a slightly more interesting episode to consider here, but even then it's not an overly impressive episode. And here we have It's About Time, AKA the other time travel episode. And technically the one that sets up Twilight's Kingdom, like in season four, as it's the episode in which we learn that the gates of Tartarus have been opened, which again, opened the door for Tira to escape. So that's something at least. In terms of the time travel in this episode, I actually think it works better here than it does in, say, the QDV mark, where it does follow this time loop model where everything that is ever going to happen sort of happens regardless of anything that the people can do. As we literally see Twilight at the beginning of the episode, like get a message from future Twilight and then spends the whole episode trying to avoid it, but in doing so, 
creates the very circumstances that allows future Twilight to go back in time and warn uh, past Twilight about it. So it's sort of interesting in the sense that it creates this time loop. Mind you, it does also raise the question of how this time loop was even created to begin with. I mean, because obviously the entire reason that Twilight does all this, including going back in time, is because she had to have gone back in time at one point and been informed about this. Either that or all these, all this stuff was able to happen to her independently of time travel. And then she decides uh, for whatever reason to go back in time to try to make this stuff happen. But in doing so creates another time loop. So, I mean, it is confusing in the sense of how the loop got started, but it does make a little more sense than obviously the butterfly effect that the cutie remark goes all in with and obviously creating all the different timelines. So that's something at least. And it does, it is a somewhat interesting seeing how like Twilight's own actions create the very time loop in question. But again, there are still the typical time travel issues that would be associated with a time loop, especially when her going back in time is what directly contributes to that. So there's that at least. And of course you'd also assume that Maybe at some point Twilight might break the cycle. I don't know. But aside from that, the rest of the episode's just kind of fine. I mean, we see Twilight doing all this stuff to try and prevent disaster from happening, getting the whole town involved, but obviously failing at the end. So that's something at least. And this episode does give me some mild amusement. However, it's not I feel like the episodes we'll be talking about soon give me a bit more to offer. And because of that is here at number 13. Now we're moving on to number 12 and we have a pretty straightforward episode to talk about here. And here we have the super speedy cider squeezy 6000. And this is just for the most part a fun episode. Now I will say that I find it a little mean spirited towards the beginning where we see Rainbow Dash trying and failing to get her cider over and over again. So I do feel bad for her in the sense that she can't even get one sip of it until the very end. So, I mean, there's that. But aside from that, again, it's a pretty fun episode. I mean, obviously, we have the Flim and Flam brothers coming into town, obviously, with their invention and spends a lot of the episode trying to challenge the Apple family. They have the contest where it seems like for a lot of it, they're going to win it until the Flim and Flam brothers decide to turn down the quality standards to increase uh, their output until they eventually win. So and then obviously they get their comeuppance with them. Uh, like obviously drinking the bad uh, cider and then getting driven out as a result. So which does make me wonder, like if they hate it so much, why can't they just feed them some more of the high quality stuff? However, I kind of get in the sense that it's supposed to be an allegory for monopolies in that they undercut their uh, opponents until they're out of business and then they keep the quality low in order to keep their overhead costs pretty low. So again, you know, I get it from that aspect. Granted, again, all they had to do was just turn the quality back up, say that they just turned down the quality for, to win the contest and then maybe get them back on their side. But I understand it also because, you know, like the town's ponies took them willing to lower their standards just to get ahead as a means of ditching them. So there's that. And then obviously we have the ending, which is quite notable, where Applejack writes her letter to Celestia saying that she learned nothing which is interesting, like obviously not every episode has to have the characters learning a lesson and it is sort of refreshing for once to see a character admit to the camera that they didn't learn everything, anything and that they took what they already knew to win out at the end of the day. So that's something at least. Now it isn't a great episode, certainly not one of my favorites, but it is a fun enough episode to where it should be here at number 12. Now we're moving on to number 11, and I can see some people thinking this episode is a bit too high, although I do have my rationale. And here we have Secret of My Excess, which once again, and it is another episode that I already talked about in a previous episode, but honestly, it's not that bad at the end of the day. I think people tend to lump this episode in with, again, a Spike episode, and people think, oh, well, it's a Spike episode in season two, therefore it must be bad. However, it's actually one of the better Spike episodes as I, I talked about in the previous video, so there's that. But really, one of the things that really sticks to my mind when watching the episode is a lot of the first half where Spike is like trying to get as many gifts as he can and obviously being showered with attention. And again, the fact that he 
get this on his birthday and people just keep giving him gifts and him just going up to random strangers and me like it's my birthday and then the them just giving him like stuff that they have as gifts like it just makes me really uncomfortable but also uncomfortable in a good way in the sense that I am someone that doesn't like getting attention all that much especially not on my birthday so to see Spike literally just using his birthday as a way of getting attention like is something that really sticks to my mind. It actually reminds me a lot of the Office episode, Michael's birthday, where Michael just keeps forcing people to wish him a happy birthday over and over again. It's like, yes, it makes me uncomfortable, but also un uncomfortable in a bit of a way that sticks to me and a way that I actually don't mind too much. So there's that. Now, obviously, the biggest issue with the episode is the whole subtext of dragons inherently being driven by greed and how they can grow really big if they get too much of what they want, which, again, considering earlier in this video, I did talk about Dragon Quest, you know, the whole idea that dragons are genetically predisposed towards greed and that, you know, like the whole supposition that dragon culture isn't that great inherently is not the best thing to have in the world. However, again, compared to other episodes, I don't mind it as much. I mean, it's still an issue, and it's still a reason why it's this low. However, I don't mind it that much at the end of the day. It's really more so like viewing it as Spike being his own character, his own individual getting caught up with this greed that makes me appreciate this episode quite a bit. And that's a big reason I have this high, is that it is a memorable episode to me and one that's probably more memorable to me than probably is for a lot of people, which again, say what you want, but that's just how I feel. However, at the end of the day, it's still not a great episode, and it's a big reason I have it here at number 11. Now we're moving on to number 10, and I feel like we're sort of wrapping up this middle tier here, and while this is definitely a good episode, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the best, but at number 10, we do have Read It and Weep, and again, this is a fine episode. Now, granted, it is a bit generic in the sense that it's about, you know, Rainbow Dash, this, you know, like meathead jock turning herself into an egghead worm. And I do love the fact that she uses the phrase egghead over and over again. Like, and again, the fact that she uses it moving forward is pretty iconic to me, at least. Again, this is just sort of a fine episode. I mean, you know, Rainbow Dash like falls in love with reading particularly with the Daring Stew series. And I do like a lot of these segments in the middle where she's visualizing reading the book. And obviously we see Daring Do like actually going on these adventures. And obviously later on, we see her trying to hide it, which again, feels like a interesting metaphor as considering that this is season two, considering that by this point, the showrunners were starting to become aware of the fandom that the show was generating and I feel like this episode is partially a response to it, but again, is also largely just your typical you know, like jock learning to like reading sort of story. So there is at least some subtext behind that. And obviously at the end, we see Rainbow Dash breaking into the hospital to try to steal the book only for everyone to find out and her to admit that she's an egghead to everyone, which obviously goes over pretty well. So Again, it's a pretty typical episode. You know, like Rainbow Dash comes into it not liking to read, only to find out that she does like reading. So there's that. And obviously this sets up future episodes where she gets very, very invested into the Daring Do series. So this is a pretty typical episode, but one that has pretty good ramifications. And obviously one that I think executes it pretty well but it's still, it's standard story, not my personal favorite, but it is enough to land it here at number 10. Now I'm moving on to number nine, and I'm sure some people may find this a bit lower than they what they were expecting, as this episode is definitely remembered well, and it is one that is generally looked at as pretty good, and obviously given its placement on the list, it is pretty good. However, I feel like it's just not one that I connect as well as with, as maybe a lot of other people do, but at number nine, we do have Sister Who Social. And again, I did debate between this one and another episode we'll be talking about in a bit. However, I feel like this episode, like while it is certainly good and has its moments, isn't as amazing as I was 
sort of expecting it to be, but also as time has passed on, I feel like this episode doesn't stick to my mind as being a personal favorite. I mean, it's still good. I mean, obviously a lot of it focuses on Rarity and Sweetie Belle's relationship. There's a whole dynamic of Sweetie Belle wanting to help out Rarity, but she keeps screwing up over and over again, which is a bit of a weird direction for Sweetie Belle's character to be in as she usually isn't presented as being incompetent. But, you know, some of that is due to some pretty unreasonable circumstances that were a bit outside of her, her control, like her literally cleaning up Rarity's room, thinking that it was a mess and that Rarity would appreciate it, when in reality, Rarity wanted it to be that way because it's organized chaos and her cleaning it up just made it even more chaos, at least in her eyes. So again, some of that is a bit enforced. I mean, there's also Rarity's parents and I believe that this is the only episode where they even show up. I mean, they're just fine. I mean, they seem like pretty tacky, you know, stereotypical Americans. I mean, again, you know, they're fine, I guess, you know, but not my personal favorites. And then we obviously get to the main thrust of the story where a Sweetie Belle messes up so much and gets Rarity so upset that Sweetie Belle starts to turn to the Apple family in order to find some connection there. And obviously we do see that with them spending more time with them, although not to the point where Applejack is okay with the idea of her seeing them as their main family. Like Applejack is very much someone that wants Sweetie Belle to have a relationship, a good relationship with her actual sister. So that was at least an interesting element to it. And obviously we get to the ending where Rarity ends up running in the race, taking Applejack's spot and sort of impressing Sweetie Belle with her not really knowing that it's Rarity in Applejack's place there. So again, at the end of the day, this is a good episode. Like I'm not saying it's bad by any means. However, just thinking about it more and more, like I don't really see it as one of my favorites. Like, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I mean, some of it has to do with the dynamic between Rarity and Sweetie Belle because while it's certainly relatable in the sense that Sweetie Belle is trying to help out her sister and keeps screwing up, I think some of it is also just Sweetie Belle just being a bit too cartoonishly incompetent. Some of it is uh, Rarity being a bit too uh, mean-spirited and not really understanding at points but there's still enough there for it to be number nine on this list. Now we're moving on to number eight and we kind of have a bit of an outlier here. And again, another episode that I'm sure some people may think is a bit too high, but I think this is a pretty fun episode on the whole. And here we have mystery on the Friendship Express. And I know there is one main complaint that comes to my mind when I think of this episode. And that's the fact that her friends aren't taking Pinky's concerns seriously. Like obviously Pinky cares very much about ensuring that the cake gets there safely so that they can do well in the competition. And obviously the fact that the friends aren't able to like keep it in and obviously give in to the temptation of eating the cake isn't ideal considering Pinky's feelings and all that. And to be fair, that is a valid concern with this episode. And obviously the fact that the rest of the contestants have to essentially like submit to one uh, prize and then potentially split the prize money even if they won. Like, again, probably not ideal at the end of the day. However, the main reason I have this episode this high is that it is a lot of fun. I mean, there's a lot of fun gags. There's a lot of fun situations with Pinky trying to be the detective here, trying to figure out who ate the cake, all while Twilight is really the one gathering evidence and the one being the much better detective while Pinky is simply the one who has the hat on and is smoking the pipe. And I find that a uh, dynamic pretty amusing. And again, this is a mostly fun episode in my opinion. And obviously one that has some pretty interesting clues along the way, like Rarity, like hiding her mane to avoid the fact that she is missing an eyelash. And obviously that is a key clue to solving the mystery. Again, I can see the debate for this episode being a bit lower on the list. And I guess I'm like not taking the concern of them like taking into consideration Pinky's feelings like more. But again, this is such a fun episode and one that really justifies itself to a degree. And it's just a fun ride from beginning to finish that I can't knock it too, too much. 
So because of that, I have a here at number eight. Now we're moving on to number seven. And this was sort of the episode that I was debating between it and Sister Who's Social and the fact that they're both rarity episodes. However, I figured that this one did click with me a bit better. But here we do have Sweet and Elite. And again, I do like this episode to a great degree. I find it interesting how Rarity is getting involved with the high society that she has admired from pretty much the beginning of the series and obviously using her connections in order to get into a lot of these events and really build, develop her reputation as a socialite. I find that pretty interesting. And obviously her trying to juggle that with Twilight's birthday party to the point where she gives up on making this fancy dress for Twilight is pretty interesting. We obviously had the main six all coming to Rarity's quarters after she makes up this fake excuse about uh, her cat being sick so that you know, like she wouldn't be able to come home for the party, but then they just come in and have the party anyway. And from there, you have your typical like back and forth uh, exchange where Rarity's really unable to enjoy either event because she keeps having to go back and forth. And eventually this culminates with the rest of the main six all getting to go outside to the garden party and really showing off just how quote unquote uncivilized they are and then Rarity ultimately sticking up for them saying that they are indeed her friends and then obviously Fancy Pants accepting them at the end which is all pretty good. Really I think this is an episode that I personally enjoy a bit more than Sister Who's Social and I get the complaints behind it you know it is kind of generic at points but I think it does enough to break away from the formula in the sense that Rarity never formally gets mad, mad at her friends at any point. The fact that there's never a situation where her friends ultimately get mad at her and they seem pretty understanding actually of Rarity's desire to be in these more socialite events. And also there's a song which I know there are people who consider this one of the best songs in the entire series. I'm not quite on that boat but it's still a pretty good song in my personal opinion. So I don't know I feel like compared to Sister Who's Social this episode is pretty close with it. However, I feel like I got a bit more personal enjoyment out of this one, which leads me to put it here at number seven. Now we're moving on to number six, and I have an interesting history with this episode. And given its place on this list, it is relatively high. I do enjoy this episode a lot, but there are a couple minor uh, personal gripes I have with it, which lead me to put it here. But at number six, we do have the last roundup. And this is a pretty solid episode, all things considered. I like the message of Applejack, sort of learning that she doesn't have to come in first every time in order to make the people around her proud. I like sort of the world building, which we obviously see the town that they visit, and we see Applejack trying to start a new life to try and earn enough money to send to the town to rebuild the uh, town hall. So I found that pretty interesting. And obviously we have... The climax, which in which the main six are able to catch up to Applejack, they have that moment, and we even see Rainbow get touched by it, to which he says, darn it, now I'm getting sappy. So again, this is a pretty solid episode with plenty of strong, positive moments to it. However, there are a couple of gripes I have with it. Now, I feel like the main one is obviously Derpy's appearance in it, which obviously they had to re-edit this episode because of the voice that Tab Tabitha St. Germain provided for her to make her sound like a boy. And obviously that isn't great. And even like the scene in general just isn't ideal, which involves Derpy messing everything up, ends up destroying the town hall, really setting up the plot to where Applejack has to win this money in order to send the money back to the town so that they can rebuild it because Derpy broke it. So again, it's not entirely a scene we can ignore. And I kind of understand why people don't particularly like this scene, even with the edited version of it. And then there's the weird stuff that I mentioned earlier. And I'll just say it up front. I don't like the way Pinky was treated in this episode. Where first up, we have her motor mouth being weaponized to get Applejack to promise to speak with her friends the next morning about uh, what happened. I don't like that she was basically relegated to that role. And then later on, we obviously get the moment where Pinky confronts Applejack about her breaking the Pinky promise. Applejack uh, basically saying that she didn't technically break it because she never showed up for breakfast. And then Pinky randomly jumping off the cart is like, Rarity, catch me. They both get knocked off. 
And then Twilight's like, Rainbow Dash stopped to get them. And then Rainbow Dash is like, no, not enough time. They screwed it up for themselves. And then they never go back to get them. And then we get that gag ending where Pinky and Rarity are stranded and have to like get back home on their own. And they're just not having the best time. Well, at least Rarity isn't. And I mean, I never particularly enjoyed that. Now, it really isn't that big of a flaw at the end of the day. I mean, it's not something that breaks the episode or anything, but I remember at the time when I was starting to get into the fandom, like that particular scene just really, really frustrated me. So much so that I wrote a fanfic about it. I mean, that's sort of crazy what it can do to you, especially when it involves your favorite character, but I don't know. Again, it's not that big of an issue, all things considered, but it is still something that does factor into my enjoyment of it just a little bit. But all things considered, this is still a pretty good episode. However, I wouldn't consider it the very best. So because of that, it's here at number six. Now we're moving on to number five. And this is an episode that I've talked multiple times about at this point, mostly in a negative light. Although considering its placement on the list, I actually still think it's a pretty solid episode compared to the rest of the series. But at number five, we do have a Canterlot wedding. And I know plenty of people that say that this is their favorite episode, even to this day, one of the best episodes in the series. And I kind of get it. I mean, it is really the first two-parter of the show that really takes the stakes to the next level. It's the first episode, per se, that really feels like a cinematic experience and what we come to expect two-parters to be. And I definitely have a level of appreciation for that. And there are things about it that I enjoy. But I still have the same issue with it that a lot of people do. Not necessarily the complaint of Twilight getting called out by her friends and basically being abandoned by them. I mean, yes, I can kind of see why people don't like that scene too much. But, you know, it is what it is. My main complaint with the episode is that it just has the wrong message. Or it didn't deliver the message that it wanted to deliver the way that they intended it to. The message of the episode is to trust your gut. And that's what Celestia tells Twilight at the end when she's saying how Twilight was right to say that the cadence that they thought was the real cadence wasn't as she, good as you know she presented herself to be. But really, that doesn't really work considering that everyone else also trusted their guts in part one in assuming that the cadence that they were dealing with was the real cadence. And in turn, any like nastiness that she displayed was more so the result of nerves before the wedding than a result of her true character and even twilight herself like she was trusting her gut in thinking that this cadence was bad but she had no evidence that the cadence she was dealing with wasn't even cadence she genuinely believed that was the real cadence during part one and when she was saying that she was being bad she was saying that the very cadence that she grew up with, the one that she grew attached to, had soured and had now become a total jerk. And it's only at the end of part one, after everyone had already abandoned her, and after she had been made to look like a fool, that it comes out that the cadence that she was dealing with wasn't even the real cadence. And yes, she does temporarily get mad at the real cadence when she encounters her at the beginning of part two, but she quickly realizes that it was the real cadence, that that cadence was still good, and in turn, everything is back to normal. However, remember, before that, she didn't think that that cadence was fake. So really, this whole trusting your instincts message just doesn't really work. You know, and obviously, you still have the ending, which obviously isn't ideal. Like, you have everyone getting mad at Twilight. You have, like, everyone, like, including Shiny Armor saying, oh, don't come to the wedding. And... Yes, it's not enjoyable, but then again, I mean, Twilight wasn't entirely in the right either, so really, it's just a situation in which no one looks entirely good there. So, that is a the main issue that I have with this episode, and it's a pretty big one, mind you, because that is the main theme of this episode, you know, it, and it sort of messes it up to a great degree. However, the main reason that this episode is still high is because, aside from that, it is a pretty solid special. I mean, it has two pretty good songs. Like, I mean, everyone talks about this day's Aria as being one of the best songs. And don't get me wrong, it is a good song. 
but I think BBBFF is also pretty solid. And Love Is in Bloom, I mean, yes, while it does seem to fit more into the Equestria Goals mold than anything else, like it's not bad either. And plus, I do like the atmosphere of it being nighttime and the whole, all the fireworks going off and just the general serenity in the air. So even then, it's not a bad song. And plus, you know, you still have pretty much part two carrying part the entire special here, where I would say if we're just looking at part one, I would say everything uh, after the Moravia and Karen lot isn't that great in my opinion, but I feel like the very beginning when Twilight first gets the invitation and expresses her love for her brother, and then pretty much the entirety of part two are all pretty solid and really carry the special uh, to be as good as it is. So even though I have complained about this special in the past, I don't think it is a bad episode. I think it's a pretty solid episode with plenty of enjoyable moments, but it does have at least one pretty significant knock that leads me to put it down here at number five. Now we're moving on to number four, and we have a pretty solid episode to consider. Although similar to the last roundup, it does have a minor nitpick, but here we do have Luna Eclipsed. And this is a pretty solid episode. It's the first episode to have Princess Luna after being reformed. And it is interesting to see her basically being this fish out of water and being you know, like pretty fun loving for the most part. Although future episodes do kind of complicate that to a degree. But it is interesting to see her trying to basically act as if nothing happened and trying to command the respect that she might have gotten like a thousand moons ago before she was sent to the moon only for everyone to be scared of her and to think that she's a bit of a weirdo. It is fun seeing Luna like trying to figure things out, like having fun and stuff, but then just getting frustrated the more that people get scared of her. And I, I will admit the one nitpick I have with this episode is the fact that Pinky kind of contributes to the conflict where obviously it's, it's explained towards the end that the reason she gets scared and runs away is because it's all part of the fun and how she only meant it in good spirit. However, she never actually explains that until the end of the episode, which in turn contributes to the misunderstanding that she is genuinely scared, and the fact that she is sort of egging on these kids to also be scared with her is something that makes the problems worse. And again, similar to how I felt about Swarm of the Century, like that is a modern knock in the sense that, again, it is a conflict driven by poor communication, which is something that I've already expounded upon in previous videos. And obviously I have to knock it a bit here because that's what happens and it doesn't really get explained super well. But at the end of the day, this is still a pretty solid episode. I like the way Luna is presented here. I like her outburst where she declares Nightmare Night to be canceled forever. We see all the kids getting sad about it, including the pony that wanted to be a zombie next year. Again, kind of a sign of the times. And then Luna getting sad and Twilight being there to comfort her. Like, this is a solid episode, and I like how Ludo is presented here. It's just that minor knock of Pinky contributing to the conflict that leads me to leave it here at number four. Now we're moving on to number three, and we actually have the highest ranked episode that I have already discussed in a previous video, and that is the premiere, The Return of Harmony. And admittedly, whenever I think of this special, I never really get too excited just thinking about it. It's sort of weird because I don't get excited thinking about it, but then when I do think about it, it is very, very solid. Like, there aren't any real complaints I can attribute to it. I mean, yes, it is the introduction of Discord, but Discord's supposed to be evil here, and I do like how he is able to corrupt and manipulate the main six into going against their elements, and I do enjoy each of the corruption scenes and how basically Discord takes all of the uh, their elements and basically takes them to their extreme where Pinky like is sad because people keep laughing at her and they're laughing at her pain and suffering which obviously leads her to become bitter. Rarity basically gets consumed by greed. Applejack doesn't like facing the truth all that much despite her being pretty honest and obviously Rainbow Dash is faced with conflicting loyalties to the point where she abandons the main six. And I find that all very interesting. Now, admittedly, I do, what I don't find as interesting is like all the low random nonsense that Discord generates once he is able to take over Equestria. Like, I get it would have been cool at the time, especially at this point when MLP was still largely considered a girl show. 
However, again, it, it only goes so far for me. Like, I mean, I get that they're trying to make this seem like, oh, this guy's awesome. This guy's so funny with all this random gags. But it's like, for the most part, I just found it kind of whatever. And I don't know, points I felt like it was trying a bit too hard. But really, aside from that, there aren't really any complaints that contribute to this. I like how in part two, Twilight doesn't realize that her friends have been corrupted and thinks that they are genuinely changing for the worse. And unlike Canterlot Wedding, which obviously has Twilight, again, being in the wrong here, not really having the full picture, I feel like it is much more satisfying when Twilight basically disowns her friends and thinks that they have genuinely changed for the worse. And then once, like, her trying to use the elements backfires, like, it immediately results in her getting corrupted and her sort of losing all hope. Like, I feel like that is way more satisfying than Twilight getting chewed up by all of her friends and then being told at the end that, like, she trusted her gut, even though her gut was wrong. So I found that on the whole to be pretty satisfying. And again, I don't really have any complaints with this episode. I feel like the only thing holding it back is the fact that Compared to other episodes, I'm just not as passionate to talk about it. Like, it's definitely not one that I would just rewatch on a whim. However, it is one that has a lot of merit, and it is an episode I give a lot of respect to. So because of that, I do have it here at number three. Now we're moving on to number two, and it's sort of crazy how, despite me already having talked about more than half of these episodes from previous videos, I have not talked about either of these episodes, which happen to be... I like the top two here, but that's just how those videos were. And now I do have the chance to talk about them. But at number two, and it was kind of a toss up for me. I thought this was going to be number one for quite a while. But then after thinking about it more and more, I decided to bump it down. But at number two, we do have Hurricane Fluttershy. And this is a very solid episode, in my opinion, and definitely one that is rightfully beloved by a lot of the fandom. I mean, I know people like Mr. Enter have talked about how this was the episode that saved uh, Fluttershy from being completely unlikable in his eyes, as obviously at the time he really despised uh, putting her hoof down. And I know plenty of other people say that this was Fluttershy's real coming up ep episode, even more so than Dragon Shy or even Bird in the Hoof, believe it or not. But the reason that this episode is still this high is because Again, I feel like the way it communicates its message is very effective. Fluttershy is someone that suffers from stage fright, not just because of her own lack of self-confidence, but because others have previously bullied her and laughed at her. And I like the way that it's presented with, obviously we had the scene where she's flying for the first time. She only registers 0.5 wing power, where it seemed like she was going to get a bit higher until those ponies on the side was started chuckling at how slow she was going, and that caused her to tense up only getting your half uh, wing power there. And then they try to make it seem like it's not too bad, but then Spike is like, uh, isn't that less than one? And then we have that visual of Fluttershy being surrounded by all the eyeballs, which is a very iconic visual there and a very effective way of communicating her own stage fright. Very good stuff there. I like the troll training montage where he's trying to get into shape to go faster, only to end up barely doing any better. But it's still a massive improvement over where she was before. And then ultimately she is able to save the day, not because she goes super fast, but because she contributes enough to where her contribution does matter. And that is a pretty impactful message where her contribution does matter, even if she is the flashiest. And, you know, considering her character arc, that is a very effective message to teach. It is a pretty important step in her character development. And I feel like the message was executed very well. Aside from that, there's plenty of other good stuff as well, like how they handle the whole plot line of everyone being sick, where they obviously show early on, like some people cough, coughing, then later on, some other people cough, and then before long, the sickness has spread to a decent chunk of the fleet to where they aren't able to break the record. So I found that was pretty good. And in general, this is a pretty enjoyable episode. You know, I feel like it does accomplish multiple things. Like it is able to tell a good story on its own, it is able to communicate a pretty powerful message in a pretty powerful way that is able to contribute to Fluttershy's character arc. And it even ties into Rainbow Dash's storyline of becoming a water bolt where she is trying to break the record in order to impress the water bolts to try to get into the Academy. 
And while they don't break the record, they are still pretty impressed by the display she was able to put on. So I feel like this episode is able to accomplish multiple things at once. And that is a big reason that it is this high on the list. However, there is one episode that I do resonate a bit more with. And I feel like it is a bit more innovative than this one. So because of that, I had to leave this episode here at number two. And now at number one, the best episode of season two, in my opinion, is Lesson Zero. And again, I was a bit surprised that this ended up being number one, as I really thought for a while that Hurricane Fluttershy was going to be number one, considering that it is widely considered the more emotional episode and the one that is more impactful. However, this one is no slouch either. I mean, it is still pretty powerful emotionally where, again, the anxiety and paranoia in Twilight throughout a lot of this episode is pretty palpable. Like her assuming that she's going to be sent back to a uh, magic kindergarten just because she fails to submit a friendship lesson one week is uh, pretty uh, indicative of who she is as a character and a very interesting thing that to interpret this episode through it really makes it so that towards the end when her friends uh do accept responsibility for disregarding her friend's feelings that it actually means something that this isn't just something to check off her checklist for twilight this is something that really struck to the core of her identity and all at the same time like is a bit meta where it does get into the format of the show where they really try to make it a less than a week although even then i mean I did point out my April Fool's video that there were multiple episodes in season one where Twilight didn't even write a, less, a letter to Celestia that it was either other people or other characters just vocalizing it. So even then, like, you know, you can nitpick the concept a little bit, but it's still pretty creative that they are able to change the status quo in this way by going directly after uh, the whole concept of her having to write a letter at the end of every episode. And it also points out sort of the flaw in the idea of having to learn a lesson every week that does encourage you to have to run into problems in order to have things to fix and to have lessons to learn. Like truly, like, yes, while you should be learning things, ideally you should be in a world where, you know, like problems are minimized, where things are going well. And the fact that Twilight sees things going well as a problem and that it doesn't give her something to solve and it doesn't give her something to check off does kind of acknowledge the issue that the show has in terms of this lesson a week. And it's kind of good that they were able to move on from that after only one season. So I found that pretty good. And really a lot of the story was very entertaining. Like the way that Twilight did try to find a problem to solve and through her of uh, failing to find a problem to solve, she decided to create a problem where she is able to like, like cast a spell on her doll and cause the entire town to go after it we have the scene of celestia yelling her name and then really bringing everyone back to normal and then her saying meet me in the library and then she wasn't even that mad afterwards like she was just pretty disappointed so i found that pretty good i like also how spike was the one to inform celestia that the problem was going on again kind of showing how he's there looking out for her I'm glad Spike was able to have that role in the episode. It, there's plenty of other funny moments as well. Like tw some of Twilight's reactions are pretty good. Like her face when she says the clock is ticking. And then later on when she pops the b ball that the CMC are playing and she's like, hi girls. So again, just highlighting how she is really getting consumed in her mind here. There's also Rarity, who's like, who has the gag of, of all the worst possible things, this is the worst possible thing. And that was pretty funny. And I feel like this episode does strike a chord with me more than Hurricane Fluttershy, where yes, both of them are very effective at what they do. And I feel like, arguably, Hurricane Fluttershy is able to accomplish more in its runtime in terms of setting up the characters for the future. However, I feel like this is the go-to episode as well for changing the status quo where it indicates to the show that it isn't willing to just stick to the formula that yes, while it is going to be largely episodic, that it is willing to change the status quo at certain points. It is willing to acknowledge like sort of the issues with the status quo and the need to constantly find all these problems to solve. So I find that pretty good and really something that I do resonate with, with more on a whole so like I said, this episode is very strong, like it's very emotional at points, even though it is able to present that through humor. 
I think the episode itself is still pretty funny with plenty of fun gags and it does effectively change the status quo in really pointing out the issues with it but also in a way that allows the show to have more longevity moving forward. And plus, I do enjoy this episode a little bit more than Hurricane Fluttershy, which, to be fair, I wasn't fully expecting coming into a rewatch, but it really came through where, yes, Hurricane Fluttershy was still pretty good, but I feel like it's an episode that, you know, like, other episodes have been able to capture pretty well as well, like Dragon Shy. Like Dragon Shy. But I feel like Lesson Zero, yes, while it isn't the only episode where Twilight Twilights, I feel like it is the episode that does it the most effectively and the one that stands out the most compared to episodes where she twilights. So for all those reasons, I feel like this is an episode that I enjoy more than Hurricane Fluttershy. It's for those reasons that I have it here at number one. And there we go. That will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps out with the channel. And as usual, I will be back soon to cover season three and the rest of these seasons. Again, this is part of a bigger project where I eventually want to rank every single episode of the show. So stay tuned for that. I do have other videos coming out for other shows that I watch. So stay tuned for that. But for now, that is the video. See ya.